pleasure um, to welcome you all back, and for some of you perhaps who are joining us for the f uh, first time for this session, to the LPG for Development Summit. Um, for those of us who did not join uh, earlier this afternoon, we heard a rousing um, speech from uh, the Special Representative for Sustainable Energy for All, Rachel Kite, who clearly challenged us um, in the LPG sector as to how we can help to contribute the maximum opportunity by LPG for clean cooking to support the sustainable development goals. She talked about the fact that there are still three billion people who lack access to clean cooking and the role that LPG has as one of the solutions. She also mentioned that we need a step change in financing from something that they have focused on, um, SE for All calculates about $32 million per year, specifically for investment in clean cooking, and that the calculation from the International Energy Agency is for about $4 billion per year. So um, I'm delighted to have a, a very distinguished panel this afternoon, and we're gonna jump right in to how we can solve that financing question really leveraging and catalyzing LPG for development uh, across the developing world. So I'll go from left to right. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, Mr. Monajit Pal, who is the manager for energy efficiency and clean cooking division um, from the African Development Bank. Um, and uh, next to him, um, Mr. Satish Kumar, who is the chief general manager for LPG sales for the Indian Oil Corporation. Um, to his right, I have John Haugi, who is the Chief Financial Officer of the Global LPG Partnership, and in a former life was Chief Financial Officer for the Inter-American Development Bank. And then immediately to my left, representing our hosts, uh, the Kingdom of Morocco, is Mr. M. Boussalmam, who is from the Ministry of General Affairs and Governance, who's the Director of Competition, Price and Investment Promotion. So I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to kick off with just a short introductory statement um, for either um, from the African Development Bank, and we've very deliberately chosen a financing institution, as well as um, two countries that are either further along or still working um, on the transition towards LPG. And I think John is going to be talking a little bit more about Cameroon and where it is in its process also for um, uh, financing the scale up of LPG. So um, we'll, we'll start our comments uh, left to right. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Powell, perhaps you could uh, get the ball rolling for us. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. And uh, before I talk about financing on the LPG side, maybe it's worth me spending a minute or two talking about the bank and why I'm here and why the bank is interested in this event. Uh, many of you may not know the bank, so the bank is, the African Development Bank is a multilateral uh, bank uh, which is owned by all African countries and uh, 26 other uh, non-regional member countries. The bank accompanies all African countries in the achievement of their national priorities as set out in nationally you know, determined plans, uh, international agreements like the Paris Agreements, and for instance, the the sustainable Development Goals. And it's in that context that, that I'm here. And more specifically, it's in the context of some plans that the bank put in place about a year ago. About a year ago, the bank put in place a series of interlinked strategies for energy, industrialization, agriculture, uh, regional integration, and improving the quality of lives of Africans. And it's through these integrated strategies that we expect to deliver on the mandate that we have and help countries, African countries, deliver on what they want to do. Let me focus on energy for a moment. Uh, the vision there is to eliminate energy poverty within a decade. Now, when I say energy poverty, it's not electricity, which is what people traditionally associate the bank with, but it's also about making a shift in the area of clean cooking solutions. In Africa, there's about well over 700 million people who rely on solid fuels for cooking. Uh, so our idea is to sh help enable the shift of about 150 million households over the next decade to cleaner sources of uh, cooking. Now, obviously, it's not something the bank will do by itself, but it will be done in partnership. I think partnership is a word that we've heard earlier today as well, uh, with entities such as the Global LPG Partnership, uh, the pri and of course, the private sector, which is well represented here. So keeping that in mind, I think 
the headline message is we believe that LPG has a role in this uh, in the clean cooking space. And while we've we're set relatively new on the financing side, the bank has been involved in promoting clean cooking over the last year or two in the context of the SE for All action agendas, uh, which uh, were alluded to earlier by Rachel Kite. So we have been in certain countries where action agendas are being put in place. We have tried to promote clean cooking. Uh, with that bit about the bank and why we're interested in, in how this develops, uh, let me just sort of make two points on the financing side. So first, on, on the financing side, I think uh, what we need to all recognize, and maybe it's obvious for people in this room, but outside, is that the opportunity is actually quite huge. Um, we've talked about maybe uh, the fact that I think the IAS guide number is saying one third of the clean cooking space could be potentially served by LPG. Maybe those numbers are going up as we speak. Uh, in Africa, there's uh, a rapidly urbanizing population. It has one of the highest rates of urbanization as we speak. Um, it's expected that by 2030, more than 50% of all Africans will be in urban areas. Now, being in that sort of situation, uh, it becomes imperative that cities are sustainable. Uh, it also sort of creates some sort of advantages with regard to things that we talked about, panelists talked about earlier in terms of convenience of, of access, et cetera. And I think that's a clear opportunity for, for LPG. Um, so I think it's a, it's a huge market there. And the other thing is I think while there's been a lot of focus on, uh, on the demand side in terms of affordability, bottom of the pyramid, et cetera, we need to look at it across the entire supply chain, which is, again, something that's been mentioned before. And if you take that perspective, the demands are huge, and, and, and the opportunity is huge. I think Rachel Kite mentioned that, I think, uh, the numbers that they've come up with, and, and the, there's obviously gaps in the data, but I think it says there's 1% of the requisite financing that's you know, required going into the space. Um, from the work the Global LPG Partnership has done, I think uh, the estimates are in, in, in some of the early focus countries, potentially investment requirements of up to uh, $30 billion over the next 10 to 15 years. So huge market there. And as we think about, and second point is the types of financing that will be required to meet this gap. I think as you go along the supply chain, there are different types of financing required in terms of tenor, in terms of concessionality, public versus private. Uh, and the answers will depend on countries and their specific situation. Um, for instance, if there's uh, public entities very heavily involved, maybe there's a case of financing the public entities roll out the early part of the infrastructure. Uh, the distribution elements could be handled by the private sector, and that could, would mean financing for uh, corporates, large and small. There's also financing on the retail side. Uh, so while, again, the bank hasn't been a participant in the space on the financing side, we've got adequate experience in similar spaces uh, bringing together a mix of public and private financing, bringing together blended finance, concessional finance, working not just with governments, state-owned entities, uh, commercial banks, microfinance institutions, um, to try and deliver the solutions, uh, to try and deliver what's required here. Um, we're also moving into the off-grid uh, lighting space, and I think there are some parallels from there in terms of financing approaches that we could draw upon as we consider this area. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Before we move to Mr. Kuma, I'd be very remiss if I didn't say that we are live tweeting from the LPG for Development Summit. We're using the hashtag on Twitter, hashtag LPG for Development. So we really want you, um, for those of you uh, who are going to be looking at your phones and tweeting, we don't mind. We really want you tweeting from this panel as well. We want to get the message out uh, across the world. So thank you very much, Monoji. Mr. Kumar. Thank you, Bichanda. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I am Satish, representing Indian Oil, India. I think for this uh, topic, uh, our LPG distribution model, LPG sales model in our country is an app model, very finest example of this uh, LPG for development. Uh, this is uh, the LPG business model, what we are adopting, not only for social and economic development, but also we achieve sustainable goals also. Uh, I'll just go back to 2013. Before that, in our country, uh, the LPG is sold at subsidized rate. Uh, every cylinder is sold at subsidized. The objective was to provide the accessibility and also affordability, and uh, to ensure that the deforestation doesn't take place, and also to provide clean fuel. So till two 2013, that was a the model. Then slowly we shifted. We saw a lot of leaks were there in the system. So we shifted to a targeted uh, subsidy transfer. That is, uh, we started a scheme that is called direct benefit transfer of LPG. So <clears throat> then at that time, all the customers uh, were uh, 
they, have, they were supposed to provide their uh, bank details and their unique identity number, the citizenship number. So the, the subsidy is, the customer is selling, buying the product at market driven price, then the subsidy is going transferred to his bank account. So which has greatly reduced the leaks and saved a large amount of subsidy to the government of India. Then a campaign was started uh, to give up subsidy by the richer sections of the society, which has resulted almost 10% of our customer base gave up the subsidy, which is almost 20, uh, 2 million customers. So, uh, sorry, 20 million customers who gave up the subsidy. So predomin predominantly in India, LPG is for domestic use. We consume, last year we consumed 21 million tons. 90% of that is for domestic. We have, as on date, around 210 million customers of around 275 million households in the country. So that means our penetration is almost 78%. So two years back, uh, we had a penetration of uh, 56%. Today, we are at 78%. So, so then after DBTL and this subsidy give up campaign, the government thought, OK, let us, uh, there are families, we, we found that they're unable to, they can't afford to buy LPG cylinder. There are poorer sections of the society, especially in the rural markets. So government uh, started subsidizing the security deposit of the equipment. So that was the biggest scheme which uh, launched in uh, 2016. That is called as Pradhan Mantri Ujjwala Yojana. And in short, it is called Ujjwala Yojana in our country. Through that scheme, so far, in the last one and a half year, we already released 30 million, 30 million connections. And government, the target is to give uh, around 50 million connections by next uh, two years. So we already covered almost 60% of that. Besides this Ujjwala scheme, the regular customers also, we have added another uh, around uh, 50, uh, 20 million customers. So almost 50 million customers we have added in the last one and a half year, which is a huge number. Uh, which has increased the penetration, and also uh, at the same time, which has like uh, uh, increased the economic activity, like huge number of cylinder manufacturers and equipment manufacturers, and also the logistic connections, the bottling capacity, the infrastructure capacity, all those things, it has stirred up the economic activity. So that's why I said it's uh, the finest example. And uh, for these poorer sections of the society, besides government is giving these connections free of cost, the oil companies, we also started financing their initial refill as well as stove, so that uh, they can start using LPG, and uh, which has really has become big success and has won many accolades not only in the country and the, across the world also. During last uh, World LPG Association, World Petroleum Congress, this has been selected as one of the best scheme under uh, social category. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, and we'll come back to that uh, shortly during, during the discussion portion. But John, I think you're going to talk a little bit about um, um, structuring finance um, before projects get funded. Thank you, Rachenda. Uh, to enable a successful financing, I would highlight five elements in transitioning a country to a successful use of LPG for clean cooking, because finance does not occur in a vacuum. These help to de-risk and thereby increase the bankability of the projects for funders. Otherwise, necessary funding will be at higher rates or not at all. Some of these have been touched on earlier. First, political leadership is needed. A government's interest in LPG for household cooking usually comes in through the ministries of energy, health, <clears throat> environment, and or finance, depending on whether it is energy sources, household air pollution, deforestation, and or budget subsidies, which commands attention. So someone needs to take the reins to coordinate an interministerial approach. Look at the effect of Prime Minister Modi in India, personally and publicly, championing the effort to achieve near universal access to LPG. Second, public and private stakeholders must be in agreement to reach a common solution beneficial for all. You need both groups to be active participants going forward in the implementation process. Third. A national LPG master plan will ensure that all relevant issues are covered. This will include two parts. <clears throat> the first part, defining and sizing the investments and necessary interventions along the LPG value chain, such as the import terminals, filling plants, transportation, and above all, cylinders. For Cameroon, that's about 400 million euros. The whole LPG value chain needs to be reviewed for financing, even if the funding is to be sequenced over time. 
focusing on one element alone, even the most important one, like cylinders, 240 million euros for Cameroon is not enough. Second part is evaluating and improving the regulatory framework, the appropriate policies and procedures related to LPG sales in the country. These cover issues like cylinder ownership, licensing, obligations when building a filling plant, exclusive distributorships, and safety. These need to be done before financing occurs. For example, interchangeability should not be allowed as the profit for marketers, which comes from the refills, would be severely reduced while their obligations to provide cylinder safety remains, thus leaving the downside without the upside, which will ensure that the number of cylinders in the market does not grow. Fourth, financial participants need to believe in and look to the longer term to enable market growth and to calculate their benefits. Cameron's LPG master plan expects to have 58% of its population using LPG for cooking by 2030. This growth in the cylinder market, an additional nearly 7 million cylinders, on top of a current base of over 2 million, will allow marketers to complete many more refills. Multilateral development institutions can also enable the advantages resulting from market development through their patient capital. Fifth, there needs to be a serious consumer education program in country to increase the visible demonstrable demand side. There's a lack of knowledge, especially in rural areas, of the negative health impacts of cooking with traditional biomass fuels and kerosene and the damaging effects of deforestation. There's also not enough knowledge of the advantages of LPG. The clean modern fuel is used can be quickly scaled up at modest comparative cost. Time permitting later, I can discuss the first LPG microfinance program in Cameroon that Mr. Masumbe mentioned, which we organized. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Monsieur Busselmam, um, as our hosts, uh, we already heard a little bit in the previous session about the experience of Morocco as one of the great success stories for LPG. So uh, we very much invite you now to tell us a little bit about the financing aspects of uh, the success here in Morocco. Thank you. Oui, justement, merci, Madame Présidente. Je voudrais ajouter, par rapport à ce qu'avaient annoncé mes prédécesseurs, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général du Ministère de l'Énergie, Monsieur le Président de la Fédération de l'Énergie, c'est que tout au long de 30 dernières années, les gouvernements qui se sont succédés au Maroc ont fait de, de soutien du pouvoir d'achat des citoyens, l'amélioration du bien-être et la protection de l'environnement, l'une de leurs priorités. Mais pour atteindre ces priorités, ils étaient sûrs et certains que seul l'État ne pouvait pas atteindre ses objectifs. Donc il y a eu toujours des concertations et collaborations étroites entre les pouvoirs publics et le secteur privé pour atteindre ces objectifs. Si on prend par exemple les produits énergétiques, notamment le gaz butane. Le gaz butane, dont le, le prix actuel équivaut, c'est c'est l'équivalent, c'est comme si on apportait du gaz butane à 180, à 50, 180 dollars le, euh, la tonne, au-delà, il est pris en charge par, euh, par l'État. C'est-à-dire le prix actuellement pratiqué au Maroc est l'un des prix les plus, les plus bas au monde. Mais pourquoi l'État a fait de cette politique de prix bas une de, un de ses objectifs, c'est comme si je disais tout à l'heure, c'est que pour pouvoir améliorer le, le quotidien du Marocain, et surtout protéger la forêt marocaine. Euh, actuellement, donc, la charge de compensation, comme ça a été indiqué tout à l'heure, avoisine en moyenne le 1 milliard de dollars, donc la charge de compensation du gaz butane. Et la, le financement de toute l'activité est au-delà de ce milliard, parce qu'il ne faut pas oublier aussi qu'il y a beaucoup d'investissements qui sont consentis par le secteur privé en matière de stockage, en matière de moyens de transport, de distribution, pour atteindre le dernier coin du Maroc. Il y a aussi les, les efforts déployés par l'État au profit du secteur privé. Et il y a plusieurs formes de soutien, au-delà du soutien des prix qui est accordé aux consommateurs, mais il y a eu tout au long des années du soutien financier de l'État au profit du secteur privé pour qu'il développe son activité, et notamment en matière de stockage. Euh, cette politique donc, énergétique nationale donc, c est, c est, a connu plusieurs, plusieurs développements, un processus évolutif dans le temps. Euh, si, si on revient aux fin des années 
des années 80, tous les produits énergétiques étaient réglementés par l'État, y compris notamment les carburants, les GPL et l'électricité qui étaient indirectement subventionnés par la subvention du fuel qui est destinée à la fabrication de l'électricité. Mais on a entamé un processus de libéralisation des prix qui a abouti fin décembre 2015. Donc actuellement, le seul produit énergétique encore subventionné au Maroc, c'est le c'est le gaz, le gaz butane. Mais cette politique et cette euh, politique de soutien des prix du gaz butane a permis une intégration du butane, comme, la, euh, comme ça a été signalé par M. Drissi, presque à 100% au niveau du territoire national. Et j'ajouterai que pas uniquement le, la politique de soutien des prix qui a fait que la généralisation des bouteilles s'est faite au Maroc, mais il y a aussi la, la conciliation des bouteilles. Parce que tout à l'heure, euh, la représentante présente ici avait évoqué aussi le matériel qui accompagne l'usage du butin. Parce qu'il ne faut pas, pour le citoyen diminué, il n'y a pas que le butin qui compte, mais il faut aussi que le, le matériel nécessaire pour l'usage du butin soit à sa portée. Au Maroc, donc, on a, pensé, on a après la politique de soutien, on a repensé donc notre, la, le gouvernement succédé en, en pris en considération cet élément très important. C'est pour cela qu'on a commencé donc à, à, à subventionner de façon indirecte, c'est-à-dire soit par la suppression de droits de douane, réduction de droits de douane des matériels utilisés dans, par le bouteille, notamment, par exemple, le chauffe-eau, le chauffe-eau chauffe utilisé par les ménages. Euh, tout à l'heure, donc, je pourrais développer un peu le processus de la politique des prix qui a été menée au Maroc depuis les années 80 jusqu'à aujourd'hui et les résultats auxquels on a abouti. Et bien sûr, on va parler tout à l'heure quels sont les pays Comment on a réformé les carburants et quelles sont, euh, Quelle est notre vision pour réformer le gaz butane Thank you very much. Um, I want to pose a question now to all of the panelists uh, for whomever would like to, to answer um, this. We're hearing um, African Development Bank is a provider of finance, and I'm sure there are going to be people lining up at the end of the session to, to talk to you about the, uh, the tools that you provide in terms of financing. And we also um, have a, a country which is very well advanced in its uh, transition to LPG, as well as those at an um, earlier stage in the process. So I just wish that each of you could unpack a little further how you see the role of public sector financing. What is the role for financing for private sector? How can you be pushing and supporting that? Because I imagine we have a lot of private sector here in the room with us this afternoon. And some of you have already touched on the very important aspect of consumer financing as well. So each of you, please, uh, whoever would like to go first, please uh, uh, go ahead. I, I think there's no one formula in terms of financing. And I think different countries will take different approaches in terms of what level of control the state takes versus where and to what extent and where the private sector takes over. But uh, speaking of retail finance, I think that's clearly moving into the private sector space. I think uh, we spoke earlier this morning about the pilots you're running in Cameroon with microfinance. Uh, there's talk in you know, uh, players in East Africa, which, which are sort of running the pay-go model. Uh, this is in some ways similar to what uh, the fast-moving consumer good companies did to, to reach out into rural areas, move, working with smaller, smaller bottles of shampoo or whatever else, and sort of trying to make the market more accessible. So that end is definitely uh, microfinance uh, and sort of new uh, commercial finance market uh, enabled by new technologies. Uh, the middle section, I think, is um, a mix of corporate finance uh, for, for, for uh, a range of different um, entities, you know, for, for instance, the distribution companies, the, the logistics companies, et cetera, um, and maybe large investments in state-owned companies which are doing, uh, setting up terminals, et cetera. So I, I think there's no one formula, but I think uh, it will require a combination of different approaches to, to unlock uh, the scale up right through the supply chain. Like, as I said, uh, predominantly it is domestic market. There, uh, the financing, what I see is uh, like the LPG consumption part, where microfinancing is provided to the poorer sections of society who cannot afford the cost of gas. That will definitely help increase their consumption, number one. When we come to commercial part, yeah, non-domestic, yeah, industrial gases, there, of course, in our country, already its financing is being done. 
most of the customers, uh, we are providing some installation assistance. We are providing free of cost or some cost in the uh, sub gas cost we are including. So we are already providing this kind of financing. Definitely, the private or uh, government companies, yeah, financial institutions, if they enter into this market and provide assistance to private players, uh, uh, industrial customers, especially switching over to LPG from other fuels, definitely it'll increase the consumption and increase the market. Thank you. I would say, I would say uh, when you have very sizable uh, financings, obviously the public sector in terms of development banks, if they step in, that's a major way of moving forward. It also has the halo or penumbra effect of, of attracting a lot of private sector funds. Second point is when you have a traditional form of financing, as we might in this case for terminals or filling plants, <clears throat> if you have your marketers signing take-or-pay contracts, that's a fairly well-developed financing technique that don't, doesn't necessarily need to involve the public sector. But if there are other ones that are less usual, such as, say, you're discounting the price of cylinders to try to accelerate usage in a market, and yet you're dealing with marketers who have a very fragile EBITDA situation and can't take on a lot of additional debt or obligations, if you go to the local bank for a standby letter of credit to help in the purchase of those cylinders, that is a possibility where some public uh, institutions could come in as a backstop, as a credit guarantee. Je crois que pendant un moment, on peut dire qu'on est arrivé à une situation de saturation de marché pour les consommateurs, combiné à la généralisation de l'électricité. Donc, je crois que le consommateur, donc, peut faire le choix entre les deux, entre soit l'électricité, soit Soit, la, soit le butane. Étant donné qu'actuellement le butane est subventionné, tout le monde se pense sur, sur, le, sur le butane. La problématique que nous avons au Maroc, c'est que les citoyens les plus démunis paient le butane plus cher que ceux qui sont dans les agglomérations un peu plus riches. Étant donné le, la, euh, la, le positionnement de ces régions-là, donc ça, ça induit un certain déséquilibre dans l'usage du butane. Donc des régions qui utilisent, dont la proportion de consommation du butane est plus importante dans les centres urbains que dans les centres éloignés. Ce qu'il faut peut-être, c'est qu'il y ait une, une, une subvention croisée. Il faut repenser ce système de prix que nous avons pour permettre à ces populations diminuées qui sont généralement dans les zones éloignées à accéder à plus de consommation de butane. Tout à l'heure, on, on va discuter de la réforme. Et l'un des points cruciaux de la réforme, c'est cette question de bénéfice de consommation de butane entre les zones proches des centres d'approvisionnement par rapport à celle de la population qui est plus éloignée. Thank you very much, and that's certainly something that's, that's come up throughout the afternoon, which is, which is how to make sure that there is the distribution across uh, the country. Um, in, in, in concern. Now we're going to be turning shortly to the audience, so for those of you who were in the previous panel, don't think you got away with not asking your questions. We're going to be um, just turning to you in, in a few moments, but um, before we do that, to give you a, a few minutes uh, just to think about it, I'd also like to just, just follow on with that uh, a little bit and just ask, you know, we have um, India and, and Morocco, both large, uh, very large countries, significant populations, within the room and certainly within um, the countries that are now really looking for alternatives to using wood and charcoal and kerosene for cooking, we have a lot of smaller countries. So I'd just like to ask um, whichever of you would like to talk a little bit about how you would advise the governments in those countries, suggest, um, to look at um, the types of financing that they might find most useful in helping really to catalyze that push to adoption and scale up of, of, of LPG. Some countries are still only at one or two kilograms per capita. So how can they really move up that curve more quickly? Let me uh, take that as an opportunity to discuss the uh, microfinance project that we ran. Uh, and this was based on a thesis that households are willing to pay for and use LPG if the high upfront costs could for acquiring the LPG equipment can be addressed. 
And so we dealt with 150 households in Cameroon in the Batoque area. We worked with the local beneficiary community, MUFA, which was a microfinance institution for loan management, Cosan Crisplan and Glocal Gaz with the LPG equipment provider and closest refiller, and the University of Liverpool, critically, with the Douala General Hospital, continued on for independent project evaluation. For 50,000 CFA, as Mr. Masumbe mentioned, or about $81 for the LPG equipment, which is 12 and a half kg cylinder, a double burner cook stove, regulator, and hose, we arranged it where they would pay monthly repayments over six months, interest-free, and $11 security deposit to be reimbursed upon full repayment of the loan. <clears throat> Critically in this, the households were self-selected. We did not go to the bank, local bank and say, give us your best customers so we can make sure we do 100% uh, on this. Anyone who wanted to pay the security deposit could participate. And we also had, again, a significant education program. We had a cooking demonstration, leaflets on LPG usage and benefits, and a calendar with safety instructions on usage of LPG at home. And to date, we're going in the final collection process. About 75% of the households have completed full repayment, with over 90% of the lend capital repaid. And that reflects the fact that the security deposit, we allowed them to count as the sixth payment, because rather than have to come up with the cash for the payment and then get the deposit, it was easier just to give them the credit. And 94% of households had two or more refills which was a good attractive average. The reason I mention this is this program cost about $16,000. This is something that anybody, you talk about the private sector, individuals virtually could sponsor this. But it's easier to work through an in institution for obvious reasons. And so the goal going forward is to get the local financial institutions to take over both the funding and the operations and to make the loans on market terms. And our next step, a second phase, is to go to 800 households. What this does is it demonstrates to the government the great interest of people and the willingness to make those payments the way the thesis suggests in return for the chance of a clean, modern fuel in their homes. So I, I bring this to the attention of everybody because in some countries like uh, Morocco, obviously, very far along. Others are not. And it's a very inexpensive way to demonstrate to the government that the people of the country have a great interest in LPG. Thank you. Would, would anybody else like to? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. Like uh, we have a gap of around 65 million customers, so the government is going to give another 20 million. But still, we find they were poorest of the poorest sections in the society who require LPG. So besides government assistance, we thought, okay, let us form a company, charitable institute. Let's uh, take donations from private as well as uh, some institutions, individuals. And that money will be donated or funded for providing LPG connections. So that JV has already been formed. We are going to start that operation very soon. That we are talk calling as a Ujwala Plus scheme. Ujwala is government funded. Ujwala Plus is private funded. Private means it's individuals, institutions. We are accepting. We are proposed to accept even donations from foreign nations also. So this fund will be collected, will be used for giving LPG connection free of cost. Here we're giving a lot of options, even donor can select the beneficiaries. So are like maybe Indians, NRIs staying outside, they would like to fund uh, some connections in their hometown, or anybody, any uh, industry would like to promote for their employees. So those kind of options we have given many. So I, I'm sure uh, this will increase the penetration further and improve the LPG consumption. Great, thank you very much. I think we have a, a mic. Um, I'm trying to look to see, do we have roving mics? Um, if you would like to ask a question, I suggest that we have, we take two or three questions from the audience immediately. And before I do that, I want to show of hands, how many of you are LPG consumers? So we do, anybody else on the panel? I'm the only LPG consumer on the panel. Okay, but we have some consumers in the room, so that's very good. So we have a market here. So we'll take uh, two, we'll start at the back and then we'll come forward. So I think that the man in the red, um, if you could take a mic there, we'll take three questions. And if you could keep them short, please, um, and we'll have uh, anybody who, who would like to on the panel respond to them. 
Okay, thank you. My name is, my name is Raymond Baudouin. Uh, my question is for Mr. Yoj. Mr. Yoj, uh, two quick questions. Uh, you say uh, that you, the people receive 80... <laughs> Sorry, translation in the, my hair. Uh, so for $81 uh, per uh, family, what the, is the supply for that? What is the equipment? Cylinders and what other equipment are you including in that? This is the first question. And when you say that 75% of the family uh, reimburse their uh, financing, uh, what happened to the other 25? Is it only uh, a loss or do you expect that this 25 will be also reimbursed in a period, a certain period of times? Okay, thank you. Let's take two more questions before, before we... So who else? Uh, uh, we've got a gentleman at the front here. My question is uh, to Mr. Satish. What is the uh, model of uh, Ujjula financing uh, uh, for India? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else uh, got a burning question that they'd like to ask? Okay, well, we'll take another round in a minute. So perhaps uh, John and, and then Satish, if you could uh, uh, take them. And, and please, other panelists, if you'd like to contribute as well, please do. Sure. With regard to your two questions, the first, what the $81 covers, it covers a filled 12.5 kg cylinder, a double burner cook stove, the regulator and the hose. So that's basic equipment for a home to operate on for LPG. Okay. The uh, second part of the question is uh, why only 75% repaid? Two elements here. One is we haven't completed the collection process. So we believe the 75% is gonna move cl closer toward 100%. And the second is, when you look at the total amount of cash lent versus reimbursed, we're at over 90%. Because you remember, each of the households had to put up a security deposit of roughly one month of the capital. And so we're giving them credit for the sixth month of payment by, through that uh, security deposit. So we again expect north of 90% of the money to come back to us. I think if I understand, understood correctly, it is Ujjala Plus you're talking about. Ujjala and Ujjala Plus. Uh, under Ujjala scheme, as I said, government is funding the equipment, basically security deposit towards cylinder regulator and some uh, inspection charges, installation charges. And the balance for the LPG stove and uh, the first gas charges, which are given on loan to the customers who are interested. That is a scheme under Ujjala. And Ujwala Plus scheme is like we are taking donations from everybody, and uh, that will be given to the poorest of the poor. So we have some qualifying criteria. So based on that, the connections will be distributed. The money will be given to the oil companies only. This joint venture, a charitable institute, will collect the funds and give it to the oil companies for releasing the connections. That's the model. Thank you very much. Would either of our other panelists like to comment and um, perhaps uh, in, the, in the case of Morocco, um, what were the initial costs um, and, and how did you get the, that going? Was it through microfinance or did you start off with, uh, with a subsidy? No, for the case of Morocco, I want to signal an element very important. It's also the type of bottles we commercialize in Morocco. Donc il y a des, il y a une grande bouteille qui nécessite un matériel adéquat pour la cuisson. Il y a la petite bouteille qui nécessite pas de matériel ben, spécifique. Et c'est cette petite bouteille qui a qui s'est généralisée dans le monde rural. Dans le monde actuellement au Maroc, il y a presque un tiers un tiers des bouteilles qui circulent sont des petites bouteilles. Les deux tiers sont les grandes bouteilles de 12 kilos. Ça c'est un élément très important qui a encouragé les familles défavorisées à accéder au butane. Il ne faut pas, je crois, pour les pays en développement, il ne faut pas aller directement faire des bouteilles qui nécessitent un investissement très, très important, même si peu qu'il soit. Je crois qu'on peut voir cet exemple du Maroc, de la petite bouteille qui a commencé, qui s'est développée rapidement et qui a fait connaître le produit aux, citoy aux citoyens marocains dans les zones rurales, dans les montagnes. Et c'est après avoir amélioré son, point de, son niveau de vie, son pouvoir d'achat, que le consommateur marocain dans ces zones s'est dirigé vers l'autre forme de bouteille. Ça, c'est un élément très important aussi. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take another round of, of questions from the audience. Um, are you all ready for the reception? Is this it? Uh, um, by the end of the afternoon? We're only day one of the forum, so um, any other questions? If not, I will pose one myself. So, Monajit, um, the African Development Bank, I mean, you, you, you finance uh, all, all ends of the supply chain, if I can put it that way. Could you talk a little bit for those in, in the audience who are perhaps not familiar uh, with the types of finance drink, financing instrument um, that you provide, just talk a little bit about some of the ways that you can really help support uh, different parts of the supply chain all the way on from the import terminals uh, throughout the supply chain for LPG. Sure. So if I was to start with the import terminals, as, as John said, I think there's a fairly established methodology there that could be utilized in terms of off-take contracts. Um, if, you, if you go one step further and you look at um, uh, people who are, you know, I, I, so, but maybe looking at one other component that sort of comes in at, at the point of entry is, is, is cylinders, for instance. Um, and John talked about, you know, standby letters of credit. I, I think I, I met a cylinder manufacturer who was coming in the other day. And I think, uh, and as John mentioned, I think in Cameroon, that's a very large part of the expense. I think it's you know, more than half the cost. So how do, you, how do you finance that? And typically, I think, in the early days, I think you'll see much more cylinders sort of coming in rather than, you know, and over time, uh, domestic industry will grow. So I think the question is then of, uh, for instance, uh, providing standby letters of credit to allow people to ship these out. And these are things that we can do through our, our trade finance program, for instance. Um, when it comes to corporates uh, who are looking to, who are either who are playing in in, in, in you know either on the filling station side or in terms of logistics side, we could we could pr be providing um, you know corporate finance loans again depend, depending on what sort of uh, you know businesses they are you know if they're diversified uh, diversified businesses if it's a very specific structure I think we could look at a project finance structure as well uh, where it makes sense um, for instance in, in in Cameroon if you know talking about cylinders and maybe there's an asset finance model to be looked at. Um, so I think there's a whole range of models to be looked at. Um, we are sort of through, for instance, on the, on, on the, on the retail side in terms of uh, end consumer uptake. If you look at the pay-go models, we are looking to support some of that so the bank is getting into, um, into asset finance. And if that model is, is something that can you know, get scaled up, we could, we could look at that as well. So I think there's a range of different models that we can look at. Um, uh, happy to talk to people individually in terms of what they have in mind and what their requirements are. Let me just let me just build on that uh, letter of credit concept. Think about the the following: If let's say you're in Cameroon, the master plan thinks about four to five hundred thousand cylinders a year through 2030 to be purchased by the marketers, and say you're 10 percent of that, so you're 40,000. <clears> and assume for the sake of the math that it, you can buy the cylinders at $25 a piece. So let's say year one you put in for a million dollars. So you say to the manufacturer, you make me the cylinders and I will pay you a million dollars. But you don't have a million dollars, easily available. So you go to your bank and you say, I'd like a letter of credit that says you're gonna put up the money if in fact I can't. <clears throat> Well, we talked to a local bank, and the local bank says, well, that could cost you normally a million and a half to get a million dollar line of credit. Well, that isn't a very persuasive case to make to a marketer. So if the African Development Bank or some other financial institution were willing to come in and say to the marketer to help you, support you in the marketplace, as long as you take, let's say, the first third of any loss, and we will stand behind the next two thirds, that makes it easier two ways. One, the marketer has to put up less cash, and two, the bank feels strong support levels and therefore will not charge the million and a half. It may only charge a million or less for that uh, letter of credit. Thank you very much. Um, please go ahead. Permettez, je voudrais ajouter un petit élément très important pour le cas du Maroc en matière de subvention du GPL. Faut savoir que tout le Maroc, État et citoyens ont participé au soutien du GPL parce qu'il y avait le budget de l'État, il y avait le consommateur marocain de la classe moyenne et de la classe supérieure qui payait aussi une pseudo-taxe qu'on appelait prélèvement sur les carburants diesel et essence et ces montants collectés 
servait à financer la subvention du GPL pour que ça puisse se généraliser à l'échelle nationale. Donc il y avait aussi le citoyen marocain, entre guillemets, aisé, qui a financé la subvention du GPL. Thank you very much. And I know, I know India has uh, also um, had a give it up campaign to try and focus on uh, um, changing the subsidies that have existed in the past. Perhaps you'd like to just comment about that as well in the Indian context. Through that uh, give it up, almost, uh, as I said, 10% of the customers, they gave up the subsidy. It was a huge money. Besides that, there was a leakages were plugged. So a lot of money was saved, which was diverted for releasing more number of connections, financing the again poorer sections of the society. That was the biggest uh, this thing. Another uh, the big, the big challenge what we face here, the LPG availability is uh, almost 50 percent. 50 percent of the LPG we import. So building infrastructure for import infrastructure, uh, that's a big challenge for us to make it uh, faster the way we are growing more than 10 percent. So we need to have that infrastructure. Uh, uh, that's a big, so where uh, we can get some finance at uh, cheaper rate because we are supplying to the uh, poorer sections. Uh, so that will help to move the things faster. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're, we're um, running short of, of time now. Um, and I, I, I would like just to mention, um, since we have a Women in LPG uh, session tomorrow afternoon at the summit, that one of the areas that the Global LPG Partnership is also looking at is um, supporting women's inclusion across the supply chain, which um, is perhaps underrepresented in, in some countries. And so we're definitely looking at uh, women as, as distribution agents as well as consumers of, of LPG. So in, in, the, in the last minutes remaining of the panel, um, perhaps each of you would just like to provide um, some concluding remarks, particularly focusing on Rachel's challenge, which is thinking about how we're going to get to fulfill the sustainable development goals and bring um, energy for all, energy access for all by 2030 or, or 2035. We already heard uh, different targets. Um, and the role of financing and of your own organization or your government, how you can best um, support that uh, in the coming years. So Monajit, perhaps we'll start with you again and just uh, a minute or two each uh, in conclusion. Thank you. Um, so I think take, going back to what Rachel Kite mentioned, I think the bank has been involved in trying to promote uh, the clean cooking or focus on clean cooking in the various action agendas that countries are putting in place as part of the SC for All program. And now I think we're poised to sort of take it to the next stage, which is financing. Um, the, the opportunity is huge, not just, not just for the bank, but for all sorts of financiers, whether it's you know, other DFIs, uh, multilateral development banks, uh, commercial banks, microfinance institutions. Um, and I think from the bank side, I can confidently say we're, we're looking to book our first investment in the LPG space over the course of the next year. Um, and I look forward to discussions with some of you outside uh, to try and see how we can make that a reality. Our, our target is uh, by 2020, we have to make LPG across the country. Every household is on that LPG. And the, uh, the most important aspect of this government scheme is we are targeting only women. Women, uh, the head of the family, we are not giving to male members. Women member is targeted. Only those women members are giving, given this connection so that she will use it properly. And also, subsidy is being transferred to her account. That's what we are uh, doing. And also, we are encouraging, like you are saying, uh, women in LPG, tomorrow we have a session. I would like to just mention here, uh, we encourage a lot of women. We have a lot of lady officers in the country. And they are uh, behind, basically, they are the force behind achieving a 30 million connections under Ujwala scheme. They were the major force. And we have a uh, few women officers, lady officers, they're leading teams across the country. So there's a lot of encouragement. There's a lot of recognition for the women in our company. I guess I would say three things. One is, think about the whole ecosystem in your country when, and therefore in adopting a national master plan that makes you really cover all the issues that have to be covered both on the financing and the policies and procedures. Second, I would encourage you as a pre one of our earlier presidents said, think not of what your country can do for you, think of what you can do for your country. There are many people in each of our countries who would like to help themselves but they can't particularly with regard to LPG. And our microfinance project has demonstrated to us, when you see a grandmother come to you in someone else's home with coins in her hand to say, I want to take part in this, 
because I believe in LPG. It is a very moving experience. And so for people who can affect change, I would encourage you, be the active, proactive agent in this. Don't just sit and say, someone else can do it. That's why we have higher politicians. That's why we have big people at the top of corporations. Everybody in this room can make a difference, so I encourage you to do so. Vous avez abordé un point très important, c'est la relation entre les objectifs de développement, rural, de développement durable et la subvention des énergies fossiles, notamment le GPL. Et d'ailleurs, c'est une question qui a été abordée vendredi dernier à Rome, dans, parce que c'est un défi qui est posé aux pays émergents, parce que les pays en développement donc, ont atteint un certain niveau de maturité en matière d'utilisation des énergies, alors que les pays en voie de développement, on est en train de chercher à généraliser les gaz du bétail, etc., alors que de l'autre côté, on est en train de nous dire arrêtez les subventions des énergies fossiles, etc., etc. Je crois que euh, la priorité actuelle pour les pays euh, émergents, émergents c'est la mise à la disposition des citoyens d'un GPL à bas prix. Et un des, comme j'ai dit tout à l'heure, avec des instruments ou des, des, des bonbons de gaz qui ne nécessitent pas un investissement. Donc, il faut qu'on... On est en course avec ce, cet, cet objectif de développement durable qui est arrêté pour 2030. Il faut qu'on prenne nos dispositions pour que ça se généralise au niveau des pays émergents. Merci. Thank you very much. And I think that was a great note to end on. And I want to ask all of you to join me in thanking our distinguished panelists for this session. Thank you very much for joining us.